Good morning. Welcome here. It's good to see you all. Thank you, darling. That's right. <laughs> I said, Jeremiah is the only man who calls me darling. <laughs> Let's take our hymn books and start by singing number 527. We praise thee, O God. And why don't we stand for this first hymn, 527. <clears throat> Good singing. Good morning and welcome here everyone. Good to see you all here this morning. Thank you for coming on this mild and a little bit blustery Sunday morning. The mild is good. And also Welcome to those who will be uh, watching our service later this week, either on uh, TV or online. we glad that you have joined us as well. Pastor Victor's message for this morning is titled, I Will Give You Rest. So in keeping with that, uh, for an opening scripture, I'd like to read from Psalm 91, and I'll read the first four verses. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, as we go through life, 
and the challenges of life, we can be assured that you are trustworthy. Like a bird protecting its young and covering them with its feathers, Lord, you will protect us under your great wings. You care about each one of us. You know each of our situations. And God, we thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you again for your love and your faithfulness. Lord, as we've come to worship you this morning, we thank you for being here with us. Bless our time together. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. That's Pastor Victor to lead us again in singing. Let's turn to number 337 and sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. 337. Turn a few pages forward to 343. Three. Oh Jesus, I have promised. 343. Three. Thank you. 
just take a minute to look at a few announcements in the bulletin. On the top of page two, uh, Sunday school is listed there, and Sunday school will happen as listed. Under this week at Winkler Berteller, take note of those things that pertain to you. Our missionaries of the week are Don and Sharap. And uh, just below that, scope church planning sessions. So our, uh, those of you who are, uh, who've signed up to participate in that, uh, you will have received an email and also asked to complete an online assessment. So if you haven't done that online assessment, it's due today. It's almost like an assignment, except it isn't that bad to do it. So if you, if you haven't done it, uh, please try to do it today. And just a little below that, uh, under donation receipts and envelopes, um, most of you will have received an email about that as well. And so uh, donation receipts will be mailed out this year, mailed by the end of January. And in that same email, there was an attachment uh, regarding our church directory. So the attachment is our church directory. And uh, you're asked to have a look at that and uh, look at your address, make sure everything is correct. If some changes need to be made, please let Susan at the office know. We have two people in the hospital. Jim Brown and Olga Friesen are in the hospital. And then we have several expressions of sympathy that I'd like to read. Dennis Peters passed away on Thursday, January the 6th. He was the son to Bill and Dora Peters and the brother to Norma and Dave Wallace. Perry Cron passed away on Monday and he was the husband to Gladys and brother-in-law to Bert and Judy Pauls and Bob and Helen Pauls. And then Irvin Wee passed away on Thursday and Irvin was the husband to Anne Marie and brother-in-law to Grace Friesen. So let's remember these families uh, during this time. Ushers, if you're ready, I'll call you forward. And uh, there's a few other announcements in the bulletin. I'll ask you to read those on your own. Let's bow to pray. Our Heavenly Father, we sang about the privilege that we have to come to you in prayer and that we can bring everything before you in prayer. God, thank you that you always have time for us. You always hear us. You love us and care for us. Lord, we bring before you those who are dealing with illness. We pray for Jim Brown and Olga Friesen in the hospital. We also pray for those who are at home and are dealing with health issues. Lord, we ask for your presence to be with them and your hand of healing upon each of them. And Father, we ask for your comfort and strength for those families who are grieving the loss of a loved one. We pray this for the family of Dennis Peters after his passing, for Gladys Cron and her family after Perry's passing, and also Anne Marie Weeb and her family after Irvin's passing. Lord, you are the God of all comfort, and we thank you. And Lord, we thank you for the hope and assurance that we can have of eternal life with you when our time on earth is done. On our own, we would never be good enough to receive such a gift, but all you ask is that we confess our sins, that we believe Jesus died on the cross in our place and declare him as our Lord and Savior. God, we thank you that you've made that possible for us. Lord, we thank you for each of the missionaries who have gone out from our church to serve in different parts of the world. Today we ask for continued guidance for Don and Shar and their family 
Lord, grant them patience as they await the time when they can return to the Philippines. And we thank you for the Octa Church that has been formed, and we pray it would continue to grow and strengthen even when the missionaries are not able to be there. We pray for our upcoming church planning sessions, and Lord, we ask for your wisdom and guidance as we plan for our church. We pray for Pastor Victor as he brings the message this morning, and Father, we ask that you would give him the words to speak, that you would give us open hearts to hear what you have to say through him today. And now as we give our offerings, we thank you for material blessings that we receive from you. And Father, we pray that these gifts would be used to further your work. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 11, verses 18 to 13. That's Matthew 11, 18 to 13. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proven right by her actions. Then Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre or Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Zodom, it would have remained in, to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on that day of judgment than for you. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me but by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you, Ron. In my last devotional, I commented that I have been pressed by the flood of information that comes our way, crosses our paths. News from every corner of the globe, and most of it about COVID. The situation in the healthcare sector, the effectiveness of the vaccine, the masks, the isolation, the case counts, the death counts, etc., etc. 
As a community and as a church body, we have lived with the constant pressures, these constant pressures, and they've taken their toll. We're tired. Two years in, and we wonder how long will it go? <clears throat> how long can we live like, like this without the body, the church, becoming weak or coming apart? We lose our connections. We don't see each other. We don't shake hands. We don't embrace. We don't mingle. We don't even hang around after the service to visit. And we rarely make new connections. How long can we live like this without losing our love for each other? How do we strengthen our bonds when we don't get together and make food together and eat together and go to concerts together and watch hockey games together and go to the diamond and uh, ball diamonds and Canuck Zot together? I know we do some of these things to some degree, but under COVID mandates that has become quite restricted and we have become tired of expecting things to go back to the way they were when they don't. We're always on guard about rules, about infection, on guard about who we can talk to without being corrected or shamed or assaulted, regardless of where you stand. Adding to this fatigue is the fact that we don't all have the same answers to these questions. We respond in, diff, uh, in, diff, in different ways and for different reasons. We listen to different sources of information and eventually we choose the information that we're going to believe. Some have become quiet and discouraged. Some are not attending here anymore. Some are more outspoken, some are more engaged with the Bible, with prayer. And most of us are sore from the constant pressure of all things COVID. And we're mourning the loss of what we once had, not seeing much hope of recovering. I think these words in Matthew 11 are for us today. We have been on a long, tiresome journey, and we need rest. We need rest that is not simply a shift on the bench to catch your breath. We need a different kind of rest. And that's what I want to share with you this morning. It's not going to sound like rest at first, <laughs> but I'm going to work my way through Matthew chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. As I looked at Matthew 11, I, I wanted to know what events or thoughts or teachings led to this invitation. Why, why, what, what brought Jesus to the point of making that invitation? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Well, back in chapter 10, Jesus instructed his disciples to go out to the lost sheep of Israel to preach the good news, to preach repentance, to heal, to raise the dead. He also issued them several warnings about what they might face. Some of those warnings are in your bulletin as quotes for the week. Jesus was sending them out as sheep among wolves, that they would be hated by all for his name's sake and that they should not fear those who can only kill the body but not the soul. So after instructing them and warning them and promising rewards, Jesus sent them off. And he likewise went into the towns and cities and preached. So this invitation to rest is not tied to the disciples going and coming back from their mission adventure because they had just left so that's not where that invitation comes from or is addressed to chapter 11 continues with john the baptist sending his disciples to ask jesus if he is the one to come and jesus answered go and tell john what you hear and see the blind receive their sight and the lame walk 
Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised and the poor have the good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Interesting statement, that last one. Are we ashamed of Jesus? <clears throat> well, after John's disciples leave, they got their answer and they leave and they go back to tell John. Then Jesus turns to the crowd and he speaks to them about John. And he affirms John's ministry. But he also affirms the warnings that he gave to his disciples, the dangers faced by those who belong to the kingdom of God. Jesus said, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A shaken reed? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus confirmed that John the Baptist was a prophet, not just some weirdo who wore, wore camel hair and ate grasshoppers and spouted off his own ideas. And not only was John a prophet, a real prophet, but the one that the scriptures foretold as the Elijah to come, because he prepared the way for the Christ. And what is interesting right here is verse 12. You could actually lift that verse right out of the passage and you wouldn't miss it. But it introduces something that the verses around don't speak about. And it is an important message. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. The message that John preached and the message that Jesus preached were both met with violence. It is the same violence that Jesus warned the disciples would happen to them. In fact, John was in prison at this very time because he confronted King Herod about his sin and was soon after beheaded. Jesus too would experience violence to the point of death. Unbelieving people inflict violence on the kingdom of heaven. This, I think, is the basis for Jesus' offering of rest. It is difficult to stand and take the violence that people hurl at you Another thing that Jesus did is that he associated John with the prophets of old. It's not like this was a common thing, prophets in Israel anymore. There hadn't been a prophet in Israel for 400 years. And with that, Jesus implied a couple of things. First, it suggested that if John's a prophet, that he should be heard and believed. And the second thing is, that, jo that uh, John would be treated like the rest of the prophets. He would suffer the violence against the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus confronted the scribes and Pharisees, you might recall just days before his crucifixion that he said, woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses and you consent to the deeds of your fathers. For they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. And after that confrontation with the Pharisees and the scribes, in a moment alone Jesus lamented, 
O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. <clears throat> the hearts of men are as receptive to truth as they ever were. Look at verse 16. Jesus asked, but to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. In case you're not recognizing it, this is a taunt. For John came neither eating or drinking and they say he has a demon. Son of man came eating and drinking and they say, look at him, he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. You can't win with people like this. Yet, Jesus said, wisdom is justified by her deeds. What is he saying? I think he's revealing the condition of the human heart. We say, you're not dancing to my tune. John is not dancing to our tune. Jesus isn't dancing to our tune. Why should we pay any attention to them? <clears throat> John and Jesus are rejected because their message doesn't fit the tune that the people are playing. It doesn't fit the way that they want to live. We were all like that. When I first met Jesus, my, my song was tuned to me, not to him. And when I submitted my life to him, I changed my tune, or rather, I, I learned his tune. I marched to his tune. If I'm willing to humble myself and give up my life for his, then I will no longer be offended by him. By the way, if you still find yourself offended by Jesus, accept that as a loving warning from your heavenly Father, not to reject the one whom he sent. His desire is that we believe him and follow him. But for those who insist on marching to their own beat, judgment follows. Jesus began to denounce the cities in which he had performed his mighty works. Why? Look at verse 20. They did not repent. Jesus, having performed miracles in their presence and preached repentance, and they, having seen his miracles and heard his message, did not respond. Therefore, these cities were, will be worse off at the judgment than cities that had not witnessed his mighty works. There's judgment for those who witness the power of Christ and disregard it. For those who hear the truth and do not receive it. Our generation is no different. Therefore, it too hates Jesus and those who follow him. Violence against the kingdom of heaven continues. So let's do a little recap. I began by recognizing that we're all a little bit tired of COVID and all its pressures. We acknowledged that when Jesus sent his disciples to proclaim the kingdom, that he warned them that they would be hated and that violence awaited them. We observed that Jesus associated John the Baptist with the prophets of old who were killed because they were hated. And as Jesus pointed out, since John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. Number four, we remember, we remember the condition of the human heart and recognize that it has not changed. The world is singing its own tune wondering why John and Jesus and all their disciples are not joining in. And because they don't, the world hates them. So I have a question. Has the kingdom of heaven suffered violence in our country? Can we really include ourselves as sufferers of the violence against the kingdom of heaven? The reason I ask is that the invitation is to rest is in light of that violence. If we can't really include ourselves as sufferers of that violence, then is that rest that Jesus offers for us? We might say that in Canada, we haven't really suffered violence against the kingdom of heaven. 
even though the church around the world certainly has. China, North Korea, Iran, these are places where people risk their lives just to say that they believe. They regularly suffer violence. So what about Canada? <clears throat> we could say all of Canadian society, including the church, has suffered the consequence of the COVID wedge, driven into our communities with constant hammering, fracturing communities, splintering churches, dividing families, and to great effect, I might add. If all the COVID restrictions were dropped today, we would not all be back here next Sunday. We would not return to pre-COVID bliss. Eileen and I have been reading Isaiah lately. And in chapter eight, there's the anticipation in Israel of the impending doom of the Assyrian army coming upon them. <clears throat> God called for Assyria in chapter seven to bring judgment on Israel. Israel, of course, realized the threat and was stiff with fear because of the Assyrian army. Israel was afraid. And this is what Isaiah wrote. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon, upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, meaning faithless Israel, saying, do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear or be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. If I look at the church in Canada, the greatest fear we have is COVID. We live in dread of COVID. Our personal health and safety has taken precedence over every other aspect of our lives. It's more important than work. It's more important than doing business. It's more important than community events. It's more important than relationships, than worship, than almost anything else. We don't fear God, we fear COVID. The fear of something other than God has done violence to the kingdom of heaven. It has violated us. Number two, the governments of our nation have agreed to discriminate against a segment of the population. It's interesting to me that the voices that for decades cried out against discrimination of any kind are suddenly willing to live in an apartheid state with first and second class citizens. That is favoritism. God hates it. Discrimination by our government has brought the violence of favoritism right into the churches. Number three, abortion, which has been legal in Canada for a very long time, takes the lives of 80 to 100,000 Canadian children every year. This is violence against the kingdom of heaven. Bill C-4 on conversion therapy, which passed last month in Canada, makes it illegal to counsel anyone to live according to their birth gender. Sorry, birth gender. You cannot counsel your male child by saying, since you were born a boy, you should live as a boy. Deuteronomy 22.5 is now illegal in Canada. It says, a woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. Bill C-4 is not an assault so much on our religious beliefs as it is violence against the kingdom of heaven. And Prime Minister <clears throat> Trudeau's recent direction to the finance minister is to introduce amendments to the Income Tax Act to make anti-abortion organizations 
that provide dishonest counseling to pregnant women about their rights and options in, ineligible for charitable status. So soon you, your, your, your donations to those that, uh, to crisis, uh, cri sorry, crisis pregnancy centers uh, will not be tax deductible. And that's not really so much uh, an assault on our tax deductions. This is violence against the kingdom of heaven. I would argue that in Canada, the kingdom of heaven is suffering violence. It may not have hit us all personally, but it has hit us corporately. So is Jesus' invitation to rest for us too? I believe it is. Jesus denounced the cities that heard him preach and witnessed his mighty works. There's also judgment in store for Canada. But then Jesus turned his gaze from earth to heaven. And he said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. What is he saying here? And why is this something to be thankful for? I believe that Jesus is thankful for how truth is revealed and received. We do not gain spiritual understanding apart from the Holy Spirit, and we do not have access to the Holy Spirit apart from faith. Believing God is the key to receiving revelation. Without believing the Holy Spirit is not given to me. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps us understand spiritual truth. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps us endure violence against the kingdom of heaven. When I prepare my sermons, I rely on the Spirit to give me understanding. I can't know or understand scripture without the Spirit. Do you remember what Jesus said after Peter's great confession? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It's not through the power of my thinking that I gain understanding of truth. It is God's revelation by his Spirit. So Jesus expressed thanks to the Father that those who think they are wise in understanding cannot grasp the truth of Scripture. It is not the work of man that produces understanding. It is the work of God. Those who stand against the kingdom of heaven, those who do violence against it, have no access to spiritual understanding. And then Jesus made his invitation. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus' invitation is for all those who by faith have come to know God and have come to know the offense of being associated with the lowly Jesus. As followers of Jesus, we too are sent out to the lost sheep around us, and as the disciples were in chapter 10, to bring a message of repentance and hope. Jesus warned his disciples that they would experience persecution and that he was sending them out as sheep among wolves. The message of repentance and hope is offensive to the world and makes all who bear it targets for violence. 
To those who suffer violence against the kingdom of heaven, Jesus offers rest. Are you ready to receive this rest? This is not an empty rest or an absence of something or leisure. It is a different kind of rest, a rest in which we may walk daily. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. This is a rest with a purpose. We're going to learn something. This is rest that empowers. This is rest that endures. How many of you know what a yoke is for? Do you remember using yokes? Anyone? I see a few hands. What's a yoke for? Carrying water. Carrying water. Okay, good, right. Carrying water and a whole lot of other things. Work, we could say. <clears throat> when you put a yoke on an ox, you can pull a plow or a wagon or turn a grindstone. Often two oxen would be yoked together. This method was used for the training of a young ox. The benefit is that the younger one learns from the mature one, and in the process, more work is accomplished. Jesus' idea of rest, of rest is that we pull with him. When we accept Jesus' yoke, we are getting into the yoke with him. We are not alone. And when we pull with him, we don't have to do all the work. In fact, we don't have to do half the work. You know what it's like when you're pulling a wagon and it's full and heavy, and then someone stronger than you comes along and offers a hand, and it <laughs> feels, feels like you're not doing anything anymore. It's so much easier. Not only are we yoked with Jesus, we are yoked to him. We are the younger ox. We are the one in training. That means we do what Jesus does. We go where Jesus goes. We pull like Jesus pulls. We learn to be one in purpose with him. Jesus says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. If we accept the invitation and take his yoke, we also need to Take the, take the burden off our own backs. We need to take off the yoke that we have been wearing. We need to unload. What are you carrying that weighs you down? What yoke are you bearing that is hard to bear? Loss or loneliness or maybe a broken heart. Maybe you're impatient or frustrated or you've got trouble with forgiveness. Maybe there's bitterness, anger, and resentment. Maybe you are suffering the violence that is generally afflicted against the believing community. Or perhaps the violence you experience is enslavement to some habitual sin. It refuses to let you go, and you feel trapped. Maybe it's the literal hatred of those who hate Jesus. There are many things that we carry that are too much for us. Bring your burden to Jesus. Take it off, leave it with him, and put on his yoke. It is only in him that we find freedom from sin, refuge from our enemies, and rest from our, for our souls. Jesus comes preaching truth. The message is offensive. People respond with violence because by nature we don't want to listen to anyone who doesn't sing our tune. If we accept Christ by faith, we become his and are no longer offended by him. But at that point, we become targets for violence because we belong to the one that the world hates. Jesus says, come. I will give you rest. And rest is something that we can't take, we can't make, and apart from him we can't have. Jesus' rest is for those who respond to his invitation. Don't insist on wearing your own yoke 
with the load that you have decided needs carrying. Take the yoke of Jesus. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Let him decide what load you need to carry. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'm going to sing a song for you. I don't know if it's the best song to follow this message. There's an English translation in the bulletin if you want to follow along. It's called Gott wird dich tragen. you pray with me? Father in heaven, we are tired. We're tired of a lot of things.
And we need your rest. We don't need just a break. We don't need just a breather. We need a way to get rest from you that helps us to walk out day after day after day until you come and take us home. And so, Father, we too are thankful that you have revealed these things, not to the wise and understanding, but to the little children, to those of us who by faith believe. And I thank you that Jesus has offered to us to get into the yoke with him, to be yoked to him, to leave our burdens with him and to take on the burden he gives to us. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the strength that we get from walking with him. Thank you that you love us, and thank you that you care for us. And now this benediction from 1 Peter 5. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. I wish you a good day. Please be remain seated as the ushers usher us out. God bless you.